Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Big Bass Podcast. I'm Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. The title of this episode might seem a little bit obscure, but BR549 is going to be the story about a bass that launched the career of a unique comedian. And for anyone that's our age or older, BR549 conjures up memories of a classic television variety show uh, that ran for nearly 30 years in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And that show I'm talking about is Hee Haw. And BR549 was a regular sketch on the show. It featured a, com a comedian named Junior Samples who was portraying a, a sketchy used car salesman. What made it funny was that Junior stumbled and bumbled his way through the routines and, and butchered his reading of the cue cards. He'd uh, end the skit by asking customers to call him at, at BR549. That was an era when rural telephone service often had extensions like BR instead of, you know, what we're accustomed to now, which is the usual 10 digit phone number. Yeah. It, it samples became a household name because of his 14 year, uh, 14 year run on Yeehaw. But did you know that he got a start in the show business because of the world record that he supposedly caught uh, in 1966. Stick with us for that story and much more. Yeah, Terry, this is a, a story that that has always been really interesting to me, but <laughs> digging into it for this episode has, has made it even more so because uh, I like to think of it as this is a story of a whopper of a fish and a, a whopper of a fish story. You know, people use the word whopper to talk about a, a lie or a tall tale. And as you right. mentioned, it starts in 1966. And Junior Samples was... 40 years old, living in, in rural Georgia, a little town called Cumming, Georgia, about 40, 50 minutes north of Atlanta uh, with his wife, Grace, and their five kids. They lived in a three-room shack that had no running water. Uh, Grace had a job, but Junior mostly raced cars, uh, did a little <laughs> carpentry work, and went fishing at nearby Lake Lanier. Uh, the family often ate fish at every meal of the day. And well, call right there, right there, that means that he guy could catch fish, right? Well, absolutely, because I mean, he, he didn't catch have fish. any money. To, he didn't have any money to buy it, so he had, he mean, had a lot of obvious. mouths to feed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but to call their their circumstances modest would be a, a big understatement. And I, yeah, no running water. Holy mackerel! I mean, it, that was in the sixties. That was in the late sixties. Well, 66, 67. They didn't get running water in their home until nineteen sixty eight. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, this was a very, very backwoods, uh, modest circumstances. And, and there are a few variations on, on just how the story breaks down. But uh, I'm going to go with the one that Junior Sample seems to have told most often. And that yep. is that in the spring of 1966, he was at the racetrack where he would race cars. And uh, his brother pulled up in his pickup truck and told him to look in the back of the pickup. Well, Junior looked back there and he found the head of a big fish looked a lot like a largemouth bass junior picked it up he opened up the mouth and discovered it was big enough to fit on his head <laughs> so he wore it as a hat around the track for a little bit uh when somebody asked him about the fish junior said well i caught it out of lake lanier and it was a bass that weighed 22 pounds nine ounces and, and you know what that means Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, even back in the 60s, people knew that, that Perry had got a 22-4, a especially if you lived in Georgia. I mean, so, it, yeah, I mean. Yeah, a lot, anybody who fished much would know the world record bass in Georgia at that time, I think. And, and the story Junior told about catching a 22-9 and all that uh, got around really fast. And it reached the Georgia Game and Fish Commission. They sent one of their media people, a guy named Jim Morrison, not the lead singer of The Doors, uh, <laughs> but a guy named Jim Morrison out to interview Junior. And uh, Junior immediately admitted, oh, I just made that story up. There's no truth to it. I did not catch a bass, a giant bass out there. But but in in telling the story a little bit, the tall tale to Morrison, Morrison was fascinated by it, thought it was really funny. And he asked Junior if he could record the tall tale and Junior said, sure, let's go. And, and so they record this thing. Now, were they recording it as a joke? Or were they going to try to, even though it's still a joke, are they going to try to ramp it up uh, to maybe field the stream or something like that? 
and then, you know, play a joke on them? I mean, is there any knowledge of, of that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think they didn't play in quite that big. But once Morrison had the recording, he took it down to a radio station in Atlanta, probably WSB, which is the big 50,000-watt blowtorch on AM radio in yeah. Atlanta. And, um, and, and that's where they started playing it. And, and that's where Junior is telling uh, people that he was drunk fishing out on Lanier, that he caught it on a little white-bellied spring lizard, fishing with a Zebby Co. 33. Not a Zeb Co. 33, Terry, a Zebby Co. 33. Said he couldn't remember just where he weighed the fish, but he weighed it at some marina, 22 pounds, 9 ounces. And and that (laughs) recording got really popular in the Atlanta market and among all the people who could could hear it at that point. They sent a copy of the tape to a, a... a recording company (laughs) called chart records and it was released believe it or not as a single uh that single yeah that (laughs) single was titled the world's biggest whopper and it made the country music top 50 chart for 1967 (laughs) you know and you know what happened after that yeah that's when uh you know he moves out of his uh plumbingless house and uh moves into a proper home. <laughs> well, and he also gets cast as one of the, the members of, of Hee Haw. Right. Which is where well, we got how, to know junior how, samples. Exactly. But that's how he bought the house was he got cast for Hee Haw. And next thing you know, uh, he's living in running water. That big television money. <laughs> uh, so yeah, suddenly he's got, got uh, running water and more, which we're going to tell you all about. But uh, you know, that, so that was, that's the junior sample story. He, he fakes the story of a 22 pound, nine ounce largemouth out of Lanier it, it through through no hard work of his own through the efforts oh. of everybody around him it becomes <laughs> a hit of sorts and then a, a yep. real hit on a national level and and he gets a television gig out of the deal which is makes him I think one of the most unlikely television stars of all time well did, a, did his brother claim any of that, you know, a finder's fee or something? Because uh, if it Should wasn't have. for the head of the fish, I mean, he'd still be living in a in a squalor, you know, for in that a, matter. In a three-room house with no running water. But, exactly. Uh, let's, let's tell a story about, of this guy a little bit here. Set up a little yeah. bit background on him. Uh, his real name was Alvin Monroe Samples Jr., and he was born in Cumming, Georgia uh, in 1926. Uh, his father... Alvin Sr. was known as Buck. So Junior might have been called Alvin, but he was always just known as Junior. Mm-hmm. And and Junior uh, did not necessarily apply himself in school. <laughs> uh, my, my, my partner over here with a PhD, Dr. Batisti, cannot identify with this, but Junior... Oh, I identify uh, more. I identify more with him than I do the people that I work with. On a <laughs> <laughs> trust me. <laughs> okay. Well, well, Junior uh, did not complete the sixth grade. He dropped out uh, in the middle of the sixth grade, and it took him eight years to get that far. Um, <laughs> his reading and writing skills. If you've ever seen him on Hee Haw, you can you can tell his reading and writing skills are not exemplary. Um, and he struggled to read the cue cards, but that was a part of what made him kind of funny to so many people uh, in the first. And he was maybe not the savviest guy you'd ever want to run into because uh, for the first several seasons of Hee Haw, Junior looked pretty normal. He was heavy, you know, obese, but but he had all his teeth. And then suddenly he comes back from a hiatus and he's missing four upper teeth. Yeah. And uh, Roy Clark, one of the co-hosts of Hee Haw, said, well, what happened? And uh, Junior says that somebody told him a comedian is funnier if he's got teeth missing. And so Junior went to the dentist and had those teeth removed. Yeah, not the brightest bulb in the circuit. <laughs> yeah, not a, not a particularly astute move, I think. But, but you yeah. know, Junior had made it big by then. He was a regular on a very popular television show. He never lived a, a luxurious lifestyle, but as you said, he got a, a better home. He got a brick home with indoor plumbing, electricity, the works, and he indulged a little bit. He bought himself a brand new Ranger bass boat. He needed something to pull it with, so naturally he got a Lincoln Continental. Yeah. And uh, well, he hey, a big... 
I, that's what Dave Gleeby towed his boat with back in the seventies. Was a Continental. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, back in that back in the days before there were necessarily the the fancy tow vehicles that you see today, guys were pulled in with Cadillacs and Lincolns and stuff like that. So it, station a crazy. station wagon a station wagon was the tow vehicle back then. If you had a station wagon that you could sleep in the back, I mean, you were you were in tall cotton. There you go. Well, for for Junior, it was a, a Lincoln to haul his Ranger all the way from coming over to Lanier, which is a very short drive, by the way. And and, mm-hmm. and Junior bought himself a big color TV so he could watch himself on Hee Haw every Saturday night <laughs> at 7 p.m. Uh, would, would, wouldn't you have loved to w- sit down and watch it with him as he's watching Oh, himself. my God. I would have Clap, so many. Clap at his knee. <laughs> I would have so many questions for him. But you know what? His bass fishing history, Terry, doesn't end with no. just this story about the, the whopper from Lanier. Um, he he was involved with in the early days of BASS. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, – I don't – I know he's in a 68 or, or – excuse me, a 69 or a 70 magazine, not just once, but two or three times. And then I think he's also in it in like the 72, 73, 74 time, time frame. Yeah, he's, he's in Bassmaster Magazine without a doubt. Because he's a big star. And he's also doing some of the touring yeah. when, when Ray Scott hits the road with Bill Dance, Roland Martin, John Powell, and those guys. He's often with him just to bring mm-hmm. a little star power to the panel. Uh, he also fished yep. quite a few tournaments back in the day, um, mostly in the South. Georgia, Florida, maybe Alabama or the Carolinas, but he fished BASS tournaments. He fished National Bass Association tournaments, and he fished some United Bass Federation tournaments. Uh, And even when he wasn't in the money, uh, he'd often get press exposure just because he He was was a regular on Hee Haw and he was there. And and I saw a lot of stories in doing the research on this, looking back at the old newspaper clips, when they list the people who who are fishing the tournament, they'll list junior samples right there and try to get a quote from him. So uh, he's, yeah. he's no he, no matter who finished you know second third or fourth you know we want junior samples forget you know? that we got to get we got to have to say Mr B R five four nine out there yeah. and uh, you know I want to take a little bit deeper dive into um, this catch that junior samples claimed back in nineteen sixty six uh, because a lot of the stuff he said shows you he was a pretty astute angler and pretty dialed in to uh to what a big bass would would look like yeah. junior claimed his 22 pound nine ounce bass was 32 inches long well that. perry's world record was 32 and a half yep so i don't think he is out of thin air come up with 32 no he, he had no, some he, background on that yeah there's i mean yeah the, the guy, obvious. I mean, he grew up on Lake Lanier. It sounds like, right? I mean, he obviously had been fishing his whole life. Um, I mean, he'd rather fish than get a job. Right? Yes, <laughs> we've got a good clip and, on that and, in a little and, bit. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. There's no doubt in my mind that he probably seen fish in the tens, especially back then, especially on the Lanier. Um, and he definitely had an idea of what what the dimensions of a big fish would be. So. And he did. And, and that fish that he he was pointed to in the back of his truck by his brother and the one he wore as a hat briefly and the one he had to explain and told a great tall tale. <laughs> that fish wasn't a bass. That fish was actually a grouper. And uh, and I've always thought that a grouper, especially the head, looks quite a bit like a bass, really, especially if oh. it's been drying in the sun in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, yeah, they're in the in the period of evolution uh i those fish have got to be related somehow i mean you you look at the fin structure the 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 dorsal fin the pectoral fins everything they've somehow got to be related it's like you look at a barracuda and you look at a muskie yeah they look a ton alike and you know i've always wondered you know if we could go back that far in time you know is it, you know, when the oceans receded and some of these barracuda got landlocked in lakes and learned how to live in fresh water? I have no idea. But It reminds me of a tackle shop in your old stomping grounds of Southern California. Oh, where, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, you walk in the store. I can't remember the name of the shop, but you walk in the store and far to your left, 
there is a, a, a six foot long bass, uh, gorgeous. Yeah. And, and I learned, I learned only moments after seeing it because I'm standing there, you know, my jaw open agape thinking I must have this, <laughs> you know, and it's actually just a grouper painted to look like a large mouth. I believe so. The, there might be more than one of those, uh, but the one that I remember was in Long Beach. Yes, it's at, in Long Beach. At a, at a tackle store in downtown Long Beach called Fisherman's Hardware. I think um, that's exactly it. Yeah, and, and and you walk in the front door. It's a real skinny store, but it goes way the hell back in there. Um, I mean, that store had been around since the 20s, and it was right next to Joe Joe's Bar, which was on the corner. Um, yeah, that, as soon as you said that, I it's – I knew exactly where you were talking about and what you were talking about. You didn't even have to mention, you know, <laughs> but yeah, they had a, they had a, a, it was like a 250. It was actually a black sea bass caught at Catalina Island. Um, and they thought it would be funny to have it painted like a large mouth bass. <laughs> it, it's gorgeous. I want it. I want yeah. it. My wife won't allow it, but I want it. You need um, a big enough wall to put it up on. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's the thing. But, if you ever have a chance to see something like that, take it because it's very cool. But, you yeah. know, so Samples was familiar with the dimensions of a giant bass. He had the head of a fish that could pretty well pass for a giant bass. And what people today may not realize is that in the 1960s, Lake Lanier was a largemouth bass factory. Yep. It is far different than what you know it today. Everybody today thinks of it as, oh, it's a striped bass fishery oh it's a a spotted bass fishery and that's all correct but did you know that that of all the public waters in the state of georgia lanier still produces more 10 pounders than any other and did you know that just less than less than six months before uh, junior samples was telling his story about his 22 9 there was a 17 pound nine ounce bass caught out of lake lanier by emery dunahoo senior well this was this was a place that, that people probably earnestly believed, dreamed, and hoped would produce a bass like that. So it wasn't yeah. nearly as far-fetched no. as, as you might think. And, no, I mean, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I was going to shift gears here. But, yeah, so, so Lanier was producing some giant fish back then, yeah. a, a largemouth, serious largemouth lake. But my, I think my favorite part uh, of the junior sample story, Terry <laughs> – is this is of course he said he was drunk said he caught the fish on Lanier said he took it in and had it weighed at a marina and uh, weighed 22 nine he said people saw it um, but he couldn't he could not remember what marina he caught it at he, he weighed it in at could not remember the marina where he weighed it well yeah, let me guess what happened <laughs> yeah, yeah. go ahead take a take a shot I bet you're right uh, every marina on Lake Lanier started calling into the radio and saying, oh, it was caught at minor, you know, blah, blah, blah. You, you are know. correct, sir. Every <laughs> marina claimed it. And not only that, every Where marina said they, had, <laughs> yeah, said they had lots of witnesses who would attest to it. Yep. So yeah, there, that that's the fishing community, the big bass community showing up in force there. So uh, pretty amusing part of the story, I've always thought. But let's dig into BR549 for a minute. Because uh, for guys our age, you say BR549, we immediately go to hee-haw. We immediately go to junior samples. We immediately go to him holding up that sign. But um, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier in the show here, that's the phone number of the used car lot in the sketch. And, when I uh, was growing up in, in, in Long Beach in the, in the 60s, we had – and Long Beach was not a rural community. Our phone number was two, let, uh, yeah, two letters and four numbers. There you go. So, I mean, it just wasn't in rural Georgia. So, there you go. Yeah, you had to have that uh, that extension or whatever you called it, the area. It, it, yeah. It basically like an area. If you wanted to make a long-distance call back in the day, you oh had to call God. the operator. Yep. And you say, I need I need coming Georgia BR549. And um, a long-distance call was like maybe three or four counties away. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, not people like don't realize. No. Yeah. It, it's it's crazy, but Junior would be standing there with a sign that said BR five four nine, and he'd deliver something that was supposed to be sort of like a commercial, uh, all while encouraging 
viewers to call that number. What's funny to me is in the 90s, uh, when everything was going on DVD and, and for sale, uh, the folks who own the rights to Hee Haw uh, were putting it out and making it available on commercials during reruns of the show. And the number you would call into to order your DVDs of Hee Haw was 1 800 BR 54949. <laughs> I always thought that was pretty great. Oh my gosh. BR 549 is also the name of a country rock band that uh, was in existence from about 1993 uh, till about 2000. 13. So but how did they come up with their name? Well, they, they pulled it from Hee Haw, of course. Okay. They, they absolutely grabbed it from Hee Haw. But the real question, mm -hmm. as you know, is, uh, and I've got a theory on this, is where did Junior Samples and the people at Hee Haw come up with BR549? And there's a few theories floating out there. And and one of them is that, that you know, Junior Samples was a race car driver and, uh, he might have been involved in vehicles that used a truck engine and a, a popular international harvester engine of that era was the BR549 and the BR stood for broad ringed maybe say that's familiar would with that that be a diesel though or a gas engine I, why do you ask the tough questions terry batisti well be, because nobody's going to race a well, diesel engine if it's diesel nobody's going to race it yeah if yeah. it's diesel nobody's going to do it uh, At so IH, i don't know IH was making tractor equipment, and yeah, they were making trucks, so maybe they were making some gas engines, but I'm uh, just curious. Yeah, I'm not sure. Can't answer that one. But here's my theory. Here's my theory. Um, in his tall tale, the Whopper, uh, Sample said he caught the fish uh, off a submerged island about a mile below Bald Ridge Marina. Now, Bald Ridge Marina, BR is the closest marina on Lake Lanier to his home in Cumming, Georgia. And, mm -hmm. and I'm going to maintain, I'm going to argue that BR stands for Bald Ridge, this uh, community there in, uh, in North Georgia on Lake Lanier. Makes and, sense. And I'm guessing that BR 549 might have been where Junior or a friend or a relative kept a boat. Maybe that's the boat slip number, BR 549. Right. Uh, that would have been something that was near and dear to him, something that was easy for him to remember. And uh, I, I want Nathan to cue up our, our sound clip here because one of the things I love about uh, about Sample's Tall Tale uh, and about BR549 was that Junior always said that when he was done with show business, he wanted to spend the rest of his life fishing at home. And BR549 might have been a, a reminder of that dream for him. If you wanted to reach him, you go to BR549 at Bald Ridge Marina, slip 549. Uh. <laughs> hey, Nathan, can you play that for us? What kind of business you in, Mr. Sam? Carting, driving nail. You'd rather be fishing? Lot rather. Terry, what I love about that clip is it, it, it just it gives you a flavor for the man, Junior Samples, and what he really oh, yeah. wanted out of life, which was just to go fishing. Exactly. I mean, that's really what all of us want to do, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so a little bit about Junior Samples, uh, his fame, and, and then, you know, of course, his, uh, his early, early demise or, you know, death. Um, it, it, it's really hard to explain to people what hee haw was back in the in the 60s i mean 60s 70s and 80s especially i think it started losing its charm maybe in the in the in the 90s and that's why it ended up going off the air uh, because people had just changed so much that slapstick style of uh of of comedy was on its way out um but from you know in 1960 to 1968 you had a a show called the Andy Griffith show, uh, Ron Howard, who everybody knows is this great actor, uh, great director. That, and, oh yeah. Director and, and an actor. I mean, that's how he got his start. Uh, he Opie played Taylor. Opie, Opie Taylor on the Andy Griffith show. Uh, it was the number one show on television and nearly 30% of America. That's the whole country. Watched the Andy Griffith show 
when it was on. Now, I mean, it, it it's it's nuts when you think about it. I mean, if you have a Nielsen rating now of one to two, you you have a successful show. Back then, thirty percent for the Andy Griffith show is saying something. That's huge. And what attracted people? Go ahead. I was going to say, and and these people are not DVRing the show. No, it's <laughs> they're watch, not recording they're, the show. Yeah, they're all making an appointment to be sitting in front of their television when that program comes on. That's the only way you can see it. Exactly, exactly. And and you know the charm of the show was, you know, it was in a rural setting, uh, had rural humor, you know, country smarts, you know, uh, the buffoonery of of Barney Fife. Uh, I mean, it was just. It was a great show. You had Otis the Town Drunk and the crazy hillbillies who lived in the mountains around Mayberry. It was just, it was a cool show. Uh, and in, in 68, the show was still number one, and, and, and Griffith decides to leave, leave CBS. And they were now, you know, really wanting to capitalize on this rural field that they had developed for the Andy Griffith show. Um, and... So then there was another show uh, back in the day called Laugh-In, and that was kind of the city slicker, uh, you know, 1960s uh, burning bras and smoking pot kind of culture is what, the, they, what they were trying to, to cultivate. And, you know, they had people on it like Lily Tomlin. That's where Goldie Hawn got her, her start. Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. Uh, <laughs> Even even Nixon was on there prior to his presidency. It might have been why he got his got you know got elected finally. Um, but then you had the development of Hee Haw, which was essentially the the country version of Laugh In, uh, and it ran for you know for for golly twenty five years or so. Yeah, twenty five seasons of Hee Haw, six seasons. That's, of laughing, of laughing, you know. So that kind of tells you, you know, what the demographics, and I, I guarantee you, the demographics are still that that way today. I, I believe, um, yeah. but he was only on Hee Haw for fourteen of those seasons. Uh, but he was a a way he was so famous it's it's hard to comprehend today because of the, the because of the ratings that they were getting. The very, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, you know, yeah, it, people were famous then at a level that may never be reached again. Um, you yeah, know, there I, were three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and, and maybe you had your local public station. Right. There were four television channels you could watch. Today yeah. there are hundreds or thousands, plus you've got the Internet, YouTube. You've got all of these other options. but mm -hmm. But for the most part, Every night after dinner, America sat down in front of the TV. Yeah. And, and if you were on TV every week, by God, you were famous. You were going to get watched. You were yep. going to get watched. People were going to know who you were. And, and, and you look at, because attention is so divided today, I, I checked it out, Terry. I looked it up. The, the number one show, the top TV show of 2022 is The Bachelor, of all things. This gets a <laughs> Nielsen rating of 1.1. That's the percentage of households watching 1.1. Well, Hee Haw was <laughs> regularly over 21. So more than one fifth of the country's households were watching Hee Haw, whereas mm -hmm. barely 1% of America's households are watching today's most popular show. Yeah. And it's because, you know, we're streaming stuff on the internet. Uh, we have 1100 channels to choose from. Uh, it, it just, everything's diluted, you know? And it makes me wonder, uh, I've often thought about this, you know, will people ever, can, can people ever be as famous today as they were in, let's say the seventies before cable TV? And I don't think they can. No, I don't think it's possible anymore to be as famous as Muhammad Ali was in the seventies or, or Alan Alda on mash or Andy well, Griffith. The, the, the number one watched TV show ever, I think, is still the last episode of MASH. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, there wasn't a household in the nation that did not see the last episode of MASH. That, that's nuts. And that number will, will never be broken. No. Uh -uh. There are just too many other options. Yeah. Um, 
And, and Terry mentioned that Junior Samples was only on uh, Hee Haw for 14 years. That's because, unfortunately, Junior did not take great care of himself. He was uh, a very large man. He was just five feet, six inches tall, but he weighed well over 300 pounds for much of his life. Uh, he had beaten a drinking problem, by his, but by his late 40s, he had heart issues. And uh, by the time he reached his 50s, he had been hospitalized multiple times for some of these heart problems. And on November 13th, 1983, uh, Junior Samples died of a heart attack at his home in Cumming, Georgia. He was 53 years old. He was, uh, I'm sorry, he was 56 years old. Uh, he's buried, buried wearing his favorite pair of overalls. <laughs> <laughs> and he's interred at Saudi View Gardens and Mausoleum in Cumming. If you look at his headstone, we'll try to get a picture up of it. Um, there's a, in the bottom left corner, there's a bass boat and a fishing scene on it. Uh, and just about a long cast from where he's buried in that cemetery property, there's a pond. And I'll bet it's got some bass in it. Boom. <laughs> Pretty amazing. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting at a racetrack. You put a flipping grouper head on your head as a hat. <laughs> And the next thing you know, you're cast uh, on one of the biggest shows that ever graced the television's, you know, set. I, mean, I can't it, picture you wearing a grouper on your head, Terry. I just can't. Yeah, uh, yeah, no. But I don't know. I mean, maybe if it was made out of fabric, I would, but not a not a real one. I've done some weird things, you know, when I was working on the sport coat, um, <laughs> like you know, eating live anchovies and stuff like that, but. Wearing a stinky old fish head? No, I don't think I do. <laughs> well, well, where's where's this fish? This uh, this twenty two pound nine ounce fish that Junior Samples told the tall tale about. Where is this fish, and where Junior? Where is Junior Samples in in the uh, great you know history of, of our sport? What do you think? I you know I, I I think it gets chalked up. I don't think it's a hoax because it never went that far. Uh, I just think it's a, a, a great prank. I mean, it, it's a funny story by a funny man uh, who was just having a little fun and ended up making a bunch of money off of the damn thing. You can't fault him. You know, there was no he, no malice. There was no malice. There was he wasn't trying to get a, a, a gig on Hee Haw. Uh, you no know, plan. I just say it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, there was no Hee Haw <laughs> when he did this. There was no hee haw. Uh, uh, hee haw came along a couple of years later, uh, and he parlayed that into uh, his his role in hee haw. Uh, yeah. I, I want you to get ready. Get ready, Terry. Brace yourself. Take another take another swig of your Blantons here, because I, I want you to fully prepare yourself for for my hot take. That's going to propel this episode into the stratosphere of trendy <laughs> or viral or most shared or whatever uh -huh. it is that podcasts and YouTube channels do. Here it is. Junior Samples is the most famous person in history who attained that fame using bass fishing as a stepping stone. The most famous. In his day, he was far more famous than Bill Dance, Johnny Morris, Kevin Van Dam, or any YouTube personality is today. I'm putting it out there for anyone to refute. Junior Samples <laughs> is the biggest star that bass fishing has ever produced. What do you think? Oh, I think you're on crack. <laughs> <laughs> ever produced. That means that, that you you know, I would maybe agree that, you know, from maybe 1968 to 1975, when he was fishing the tournaments. Who's a bigger I star? Who I'm, was a bigger I'm, star? I'm, that, that got to start through bass fishing. That got his start through bass fishing. Bill Dance got his start through bass fishing. Bill Dance is not. Bill Dance is one of my favorite people on the planet. He is a fraction as well known as Junior Samples. He's the most well known bass fisherman that there is. I yes, mean, how he, can you? Oh, yes, man. he is. But but Junior Samples used bass fishing to achieve a level of fame that no one else has ever approached. I don't know that I agree. I I mean maybe he maybe he's he bigger. was in more maybe he was in more households than Bill Dance was. 
Oh yeah, uh, yeah. 20, I, I, I assure I have you that twenty one percent of households were, have not watched Bill. <laughs> yeah. I watched a lot I, more episodes of Bill Dance than I have of Hee Haw, but Junior Samples, the biggest star that bass fishing has ever produced. You heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. God save us. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing against nothing against junior samples, but holy mackerel. I mean your I think your friendship with Bill Dance just went to Dewey. I love you, Bill Dance. I love you, Bill Dance. You're you're (laughs) absolutely one of the greatest people uh, this world has ever produced. But Junior Samples is the biggest star bass fishing ever created. Now go ahead. Uh, Terry Batiste, I need you to hang with me here. I need you to listen carefully with me. I need you to uh-huh. participate with me at the end of my next comments. Okay, get ready. Mm-hmm. Get ready. Now, as you'll recall, two or three times in each episode uh, on Hee Haw, uh, they would pay tribute to some small town or some important figure in American history. Mm-hmm. The cast member would pop up and he'd say, Salute of South Carolina, population 15,385. And then the rest of the cast would pop out of this cornfield set and they would say, Salute. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Terry Batista, get ready. Now, from the Big Bass podcast, I am proud to say, Junior Samples, Salute. Salute. <laughs> Oh my God! I, I love I, I it. Think it's, I think it's time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We also hope you do us a favor: please rate us, share, review, uh, give us a thumbs up. Uh, you know, just you know, tell your fish and friends about us. Uh, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us by email. Just send us a note to uh, Ken at the Big Bass Podcast dot com or Terry at TheBigBassPodcast.com, or Nathan at TheBigBassPodcast.com. And then check back next week, and we'll have a new show about another big bass with information that you will not and cannot find anywhere else, and we guarantee that. Take care. <laughs>